Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to our first Social Capitalist Luncheon Series event. My name is Mohan Anuni, and it's my pleasure to serve as your MC today. I'm a board member here at SCI, and I'm pleased to support the organization. You know, it's really, I felt connected with David and others uh, because the kind of work SCI does in the community, especially with the priority of promoting youth success. And that's because that's the future and, uh, and healthy communities. Uh, an organization is a reflection of the character of its people. Any organization is a reflection of its people. And SCI has a very good and great dedicated people imaging its vision and mission in our communities. And I'm glad to be part of that. Uh, today's event will feature a panel discussion on a very important topic, building social capital for an equitable recovery. Before we turn to the panel, uh, we're going to first take a few minutes to hear about SEI's vision and mission and recent accomplishments. First, let me introduce you to my dear friend and colleague, uh, David Crowley, president and founder of SEI. Go ahead, David. All right. Thank you, Pastor Mo. After a long winter of being hunkered down, with a lot of Zoom meetings, emails, and plenty of home cooking. An early spring day, nice and warm, found me with a big arm full of supplies headed to the common in Woburn for the AAPI support vigil we were helping to organize. As I stood there with that box, I realized I'm, I was actually gonna be meeting several SCI team members in person for the first time, despite the fact that we had seen each other for months, uh, probably in dozens, if not hundreds of Zoom meetings, but that has been our year, I suppose. Social capital is all about the value of connecting with one another in communities. At SCI, we're especially focused on the idea of connecting people across differences in order to create healthy communities for everyone. Like any organization, SCI has had to adapt what we do over the past year plus. We have been able to figure out how to run some powerful programs in this kind of format, including a great new youth pitch contest that we did about a month ago, uh, several anti-racism programs we partnered on that were very compelling, and our AmeriCorps members did a great job figuring out how to adapt to hybrid, virtual, and continued in-person service. But despite the, having some success through this kind of program on screens, when I think back to the year, it is definitely some of those in-person moments, the few we were able to have that really stay with me. I think back to a, a November day, it was kind of chilly and I was running around town dropping off extra leaf bags to our many volunteers who turned out to help rake leaves for isolated senior citizens. And I saw the teens, um, you know, they're happy to help those seniors, but they were just so excited to be out and about doing stuff with their peers. And it was great that volunteering and service was a way to enable that to happen safely. I also think back to October when we got news that an annual postal service food drive was canceled and we were click, quickly able to leverage our network to recruit volunteers by neighborhood to go door to door and take up a collection in place of the postal drive that usually would happen. The result was thousands of dollars of food donated to the pantry. And that kind of work, you know, responding, I know probably everyone here has been involved in SCI definitely very much so. There have been so many basic needs right in front of us and tackling and, and helping to address those has been a big part of our work in the past year. Uh, but going back to the vigil for a moment, um, in many ways, putting together a vigil, working with community partners on shot, short notice to address something really pressing, is, it's what we've been doing since 2002 when we started. But in some ways, there was something different I felt about it at that time on that day. And it wasn't just because we were wearing masks. It has something to do with the fact that I, just this feeling that emerging from this year and starting to reconnect and re-engage with one another in person, I think we have a new opportunity to collaborate in new and powerful ways. We were just chatting in the little pre-meeting of panelists about all the innovations. And, and the question is, how do we come back with new eyes 
looking clear at the problems of racism, inequities, and how do we take that innovation and keep working together to keep moving forward and making real progress on those issues. That's the subject of the panel we'll go to momentarily. I look forward to the conversation and I look forward to joining with you moving forward in the year ahead. Thanks. Now I would like to call upon Phil Gordon, SCI's Deputy Director, to tell us more about the SCI AmeriCorps program. Phil. Thank you <laughs> and good afternoon everybody and, and welcome uh, and we appreciate you joining us today. SCI is based in Hoover, Massachusetts and we are extremely proud of the ongoing impact we have been able to make in our hometown. And throughout Greater Boston, our SCI AmeriCorps program supports youth success by connecting young people with the relationships, experiences, and resources they need to succeed. Each year, between September and June, over 20 SCI AmeriCorps members engage in volunteer outreach, capacity building activities that increase volunteer engagement, provide leadership training, and create service learning opportunities for youth serving programs at our nonprofit partner organizations. Our SCI AmeriCorps members seek to increase the social capital of young people by serving in one of two roles. First, our volunteer outreach coordinators, they build capacity to support volunteer engagement efforts for use of focused programming through organizing community events, community outreach efforts, and program management. And second, our, our youth leadership coordinators who build capacity to support youth development efforts through direct academic support community service learning activities, and leadership opportunities. This service year obviously brought new and unpredictable challenges for our program and, and members. I've been blessed to lead, support, and guide our 2021 cohort of young women and men who have all made significant sacrifices in service this year. I know firsthand that the impact of each of our members was needed more than ever during the pandemic. So now it is my honor to introduce SCI AmeriCorps Volunteer Outreach Coordinator, Leandra Reyes, who has been serving directly with SCI since, since September 2020, and will share just a slice of the impact that she has made so far this year. Thank you, Phil. When the pandemic made its mark last year, I was serving as the Youth Co Leadership Coordinator with Girls Inc. of Lynn. Being the advisor to six teenage girls during a time of so much unknown taught me a lot about the importance of relationships. For many of the youth I served, Girls Inc. was their safe place and it was suddenly taken from them. I knew that beyond our weekly meetings, I needed to create a separate space for them to express their feelings. Having one-on-one -on -one check ins with the youth was a priority for me to ensure they had the support they needed. This helped me prepare for my second year of service with SCI. The one-on-one -on -one check ins only strengthened the relationships I had and continue to have with the youth. As a second year member, I knew it was important to continue these check ins with the members of the cohort as many of them would be starting their service year virtually. Having the check ins meant creating a space for myself and the members to get to know each other, even with the barrier of a screen. These check-ins led to friendships outside of Zoom meetings and allowed me to build social capital for myself and others. Another way I built social capital was through emailing volunteers individually and calling the senior citizens in the community to introduce myself and start making those connections. I understood the importance of building trust in relationships in the community, especially as someone new to this community. I knew relationships were formed when many volunteers of all ages helped shovel the snow for the seniors during every storm, some volunteers even going to multiple homes. I knew relationships were formed when members of the community attended our Black History Month Film Fridays and contributed to rich discussions. 
and I really knew relationships were formed during our leaf raking event when I went to a senior's house to distribute extra supplies for the volunteers and ended up speaking for about 45 minutes with the women who lived there, with masks on, of course. We talked about anything and everything, and I'll never forget the smile on her face as she said, thank you so much for talking with me today. I knew there would be significant challenges this service year, but I'm proud of the efforts we made to keep building and strengthening our community. Now I know that I can continue to support and serve people wherever I go and in whatever I do. And I look forward to continuing to make positive impacts in my community. Thank you. Thank you, Leandra, for sharing your wonderful story of service. Uh, we love having you in our team here. Has, uh, as you may know, the Social Capitalist Luncheon is our biggest fundraiser of the year. Your donations uh, help SCI carry its mission. Uh, your support is so crucial at this time because SCI does something about the continued inequities that have come through continued injustices in our society. Okay, it takes resources to bring light, hope and healing to our communities. Right? And it does take that. And uh, we're living in strange times, uh, you know, uh, and as uh, uh, I think it was uh, Charles Dickens who wrote in his book, it was the best of times and the worst of times. And uh, we live in a period of time where the social consciousness of our young people have been raised as a, as a community leader here in Woburn, the young people are, what can I do? and people around of all ages and that what can I do? The consciousness of our community has, has risen up. And it is time for us to turn towards what Dr. King called, uh, you know, this arc of justice to turn, you know, the arc of the moral universe to turn towards justice. And we can do a little part of that. So we're grateful for your support and we received so far from, your, from our general sponsors. And I think it's around, uh, uh, so we've raised over $65,000 already, and we need just to raise an additional, I think, 10400 or so. Uh, thank you for the continued giving through donations and our auction to reach our goal. And to explain more about how you can donate, how you can be a source of blessing to us today. Uh, David, can you explain how we can all donate? Sure. Happy to do that. It's very easy. If you have a phone, probably most of us also have a phone, right? Phone, if you have it handy, you, 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 all you need to do is get a new text message up and text to the number 50155, the words SCI 2021. So text SCI 2021 to 50155. And then you just follow the prompts. Um, once you send that message, it will lead you to ask, you know, what you'd like to give and any amount you can give uh, makes a difference. You know, we're a small lean organization, so any amount goes a long way uh, and we appreciate all the support. And the other way you can give is also through our, our online auction. We decided to add that to the mix this year. We have a lot of interesting items from sports to food and art, and you can check that out. It, um, the link is in the chat, but you can also go to socialcapitalinc.org. There's a big button there. Uh, so we appreciate all the support and we appreciate you coming out for this important conversation today and I'll kick it back so we can get into it. Uh, thank you, David. Now it's time for our building social capital panel. Yay, here we go. <laughs> David Shapiro, CEO of Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership, and he was a recipient of SCI's Idolist Award in uh, 2017. David, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pastor Mo. Uh, I am uh, so honored to be with you. Uh, appreciate David and Philip's leadership. Leandra, I think in many ways, um, you have our deep gratitude for your role in the mentoring movement, your role in social capital, demonstrating the power of relationships, everything. I talk about all day and we talk about it mentor all day you're actually doing uh, and we just seek to support the thousands of organizations like you know girls inc uh, where you serve and, and others in delivering that connection and you described so accurately the way purpose and belonging uh, got ripped away from from many of us um, and the way in which you were able to meet that void uh, and go the extra mile to strengthen those relationships and show up for for so many so thank you for being an exemplar of all the best of social capital. 
Um, I have an incredible honor and privilege today, but also maybe the easiest job in the world. I've got three of the most dynamic people in the world to just get out of the way from and, and let them uh, speak the gospel of social capital as uh, leaders with authenticity, leaders with depth, leaders with very different perspectives, uh, but a similar uh, drive and dedication uh, towards the urgency of now, uh, towards servant leadership, um, and towards both an equitable now and an equitable recovery, um, and making good on an awakening that was not an awakening for many, uh, but was an awakening for some and gives us a broader opportunity to, I think, uh, kick down the door of justice and, and get us uh, to a place that we have too stubbornly not been making progress towards. Um, and so uh, I, I just wanna, wanna thank David, thank SCI. Um, all of the folks that are on this panel have been honored by SCI. Um, and, and I'm excited for the folks that will be honored later. Um, I'm going to start with you, Councilor Mejia, if that's okay. I saw you just got a phone call, so I want to make sure we're not taking you away from urgent business. You want me to start somewhere else? Yes. Okay, good. We can, we can always improv. It's the beauty of social capital. Um, so um, I'm going to turn to you, Robert, um, because you've been at this a long time. <laughs> Sometimes I've been lucky enough to be at it with you. Um, but a lot of people, what I think is interesting, Robert, you've worn a ton of hats in the city and I'm not going to read bios. People can read bios online. What's exciting right now is to hear from human beings. Um, you've worn hats in philanthropy. You've worn hats in you know, community. You've worn hats in youth sports. You brought all that together to create the base. Um, and many will describe the base as a baseball program, as an urban baseball program. Um, but talk to me about the way you see the base as a hub of social capital and what that has meant in this moment and what it means beyond, because we know baseball is just a tiny piece, but talk to me about how you see it every day and how that's transcended in the pandemic. Oh, <clears throat> thank you, David. First and foremost, I wanna just acknowledge and celebrate David Crowley and the SCI team and your leadership. Um, it is cool to be on a Zoom call with people you love and respect. And honestly, David, <clears throat> just all you've done, you know, throughout your career with mentor Bob Giannino is a legend and true story. My son's 32 years old. When my son was finishing high school to go to college, I reached out to Bob Giannino and Bob helped my whole son with the whole college process. And Julia is just, you know, just this young and up and coming tremendous leader. Um, David, listen, you said this. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to say I'm that young person that grew up in this city. Um, I am who I am because of who have raised me. And there were some of the greatest folks when you talk about social capital. Think of it. I was a teenager and I was raised by Mel King, the late Jorge Hernandez, Ray and Gloria Whitehammond. Um, I just had this set of folks that just was about how do you build social capital? How do you touch the ground? How do you engage folks? How do you make sure that you're committed to, you know, having an impact today, but while leaving the community better, you know, the next day, the next week, the next month and years to come. Um, so my whole career has really been about the power of young people. And I, I appreciate what you said, how others may describe us as a baseball team. You know, we define us as around investing in urban talent because urban talent is America's talent. And in some ends, um, you know, urban talent is global talent. Our whole idea is about how are we investing our young folks in Leandra? I'll be honest, you just lit me up. Like, I'm like, I wish we were personal because I would have given you a big hug. But it is about how are we investing in our talent? How are we reaching out into our communities? How are we proud about Roxbury, George, Hester, Mattapan? Um, how are we engaging our young folks to be that next generation of leaders, but that next generation of homeowners, that next generation of, um, you know, uh, around taking on civic action. So I think for me, David, our whole idea is we have seen what COVID has done. And on a very personal end, I think everyone knows I caught COVID. I was hospitalized for 25 days on a ventilator fighting for my life. Um, but what continued on was our young folks, despite dealing with food insecurity, despite dealing with mental health and trauma, despite you know, Boston Public Schools being closed, 
despite not being able to go out to our parks and playgrounds, our young folks rise, our young folks sustain, and our young folks keep moving forward. And that's what we're trying to do at the base. And honestly, that's what excites me about what SCI and their AmeriCorps leaders and folks are doing every single day. So invest in our urban town, folks, because there are now, there are tomorrow, and there are future. Thank you so much, Robert. And I, I would add to that when you were hearing all this stuff about pods and you know communities creating pods, the first place I heard about a pod in Boston, outside of you know in some communities where they were getting them done in houses, was Robert saying the base will be a pod. You let me know where and when and who, and we'll be a pod. And and it was going on right away. They were going to make sure it was a place of learning, and there was no need. They weren't meeting, and that's what what to me makes it so much more than a baseball program is having walked through those doors with kids, they know every one of their needs, whatever it takes, will get met. There's no question they can't ask that they won't find a resource, baseball and, or not. And it's not, it's not being afraid to follow the leadership of others and thanking Julia for being a leader on the pods. And we learned so much from her leadership and her willingness to step out that we knew we needed to do something. So Julia, publicly, thank you for being a leader on that movement. And yeah, and Councilman here, I will turn to you if, if that works now. Um, and uh, I want to ask you a little different question, um, but but you can obviously, like any any good elected official, take it wherever you want. Um, but to Robert's point, um, there's this interesting thing, right? When you are an activist outside the system pushing on it. Um, when you are campaigning to win, you are building social capital around winning a campaign. Um, then you get into office, you become a part of it. You're still actively working to make things better, but you become a part of it. And now you're building social capital around something else and you're doing it in historic conditions as someone new to it. Can you talk to us about what role social capital played for you as you began to try to figure out how now I'm here and there's a pandemic and what am I pushing for and against and how am I building? Yeah, no, thank you. And thank you all for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here celebrating the amazing work that SCI does every day, all day, um, and looking forward to continuing this partnership. Um, yeah, absolutely. And for those who don't know, uh, we won by one vote. So we already came in in a very traumatic form and um, we, weren't, we didn't even get comfortable in our seats. And you know, a few months later, uh, the seat that we worked so hard to get into, we had to take our whole entire office um, to uh, virtual uh, world. So it made it harder for us to build relationships within the council. Um, but what we did is we leaned into the work in, in the best way we know how, which is really through taking our lead from those who are living the realities and doing the work. And David, you know, I'm really glad that you asked me about the tension about, um, I'm, I'm, I am an activist, you know, I will always be, regardless of whether or not I'm an elected official. And what I have come to learn is that you know, now I'm in the, sim in the same system that I fought my entire life. And so how I navigate the system has to be um, not different, but I just have to be a little bit more sophisticated. And I think it's the inside and outside strategy of building that social capital and working alongside nonprofit organizations, youth activists, and, and folks who are really in the boots on the ground. They inform every single decision that we've made. We have worked in partnership with folks to design the way we respond as an office. I always say it's the four P's, protocols, policies, procedures, um, and, and, um, and uh, oh my God, there's three. Um, and, and so for me, it was always been, what are the needs of the people and working in community with folks to design um, the, the solutions to those problems. And I'll give you some uh, very specific examples to that. Um, during COVID, we saw a lot of food insecurity. We filed an ordinance that we worked alongside other food justice advocates and created the retail kitchen um, ordinance, which allows folks to incubate in their homes and be able to uh, sell food um, at farmers markets or online. We saw this as an opportunity for two things. One, I always see everything through a violence prevention strategy because if moms are now able to cook and build capital from home, then they're also able to watch their kids as they do it. And then the other piece, um, it is it provides culturally competent foods right in the neighborhoods. That came through the activists that we worked with. The learning pod was very similar. It was a constituent that called. We 
some problem solving and we created an opportunity to hire parents to work in these pods. Uh, so that again was building our networks and, and working with our um, constituents. And then the last thing that I'll say is that we're working, we worked with a group of young people to file a home rule petition to lower the voting age. Um, and to Robert's point, Young people, I, I don't say they're our future, they're our present. And we have to build their capacity today to ensure that they're ready to step up and build that bench so that they can not only elect the leaders that they feel best represent them so that they can start exercising their civic engagement muscle earlier and being really intentional about what that looks like. And to that point, I'll just end, um, is that our office also created a Civic Engagement Institute last summer in collaboration with Madison Park um, Development Corp. And we hired 12 young people and we taught them about policy making, youth, engage, uh, youth uh, civic engagement and um, outreach. And two of the young people that worked with us uh, had a passion for food justice and restorative justice in, in the schools. And they wrote their own public hearing order. Um, they drafted up my speech. And so when we talk about building capacity, tapping into that social capital and creating space for other young people to lead, that is the work that we've been invested in. And COVID has created many opportunities through Zoom and other ways to really step up our innovative ways of engaging people and including them in their own lives. Wow, thank you, counselor. You, that was amazing, amazing just tour de force on every aspect of social capital that you're addressing from your seat. I think if there, if there's a so, social capital counselor, it's uh, it's definitely you. Um, I I will turn to Bob. You know, Bob, I know you've been in the sector for a long time. You've you know you've taught, you've run you inspire, you aspire and reinvented it in many ways in terms of um, advice policy. Um, as well as just retail mentoring and FAFSA guidance for college. And then now you sit at United Way, which, and you don't sit, you run, I know you, but you're at United Way, which provides so much institutional social capital around trying to get different sectors and different organizations to think together and try to attack things at scale. Although sometimes I think we're a little overly obsessed with scale, but Talk to me about uh, you, similar to the counselor, got into this job, you know, and, and then pandemic, you know, have fun. Um, talk to me about what is sort of the best and also maybe some of the holes in social capital that you see as we try to respond more broadly um, and bring our forces to bear for good uh, from a social capital standpoint. Uh, thank you, David, um, and uh, and what an honor to be here today uh, with you all, um, with these ama my amazing uh, co-panelists um, who are regular inspirations to me. Um, while I've never had the opportunity to meet uh, Councillor uh, Mejia in person, um, I've watched um, uh, the incredible leadership that you've brought, and and Robert is one of my all-time heroes. So to be on this panel is really a uh, um, is, is a special moment for me. Speaking of social capital, I've known David Crowley for 33 years. He may not want me to say that, uh, but you know, we were both high school students when we met. And really social capital is the reason that I'm in the role that I am today. And, 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 and you know, I think about the folks that have invested in me over while I was a, a young person um, and as a young leader in different roles, uh, Dane Perry, who I know is on this, on this call today was one of my very earliest mentors um, uh, a number of years ago. Charlie Rose, Stanley Pollock. I mean, these are folks that when I was a high school and early college student kind of took me under their wing and, and helped me um, sort of see the kind of impact you could have. Um, and that in a lot of ways is, I think the part of the story, the good part of the story during this pandemic is the degree to which um, we looked to one another in so many different ways. And um, you know, one of the things that we uh, had the opportunity to do at United Way is work very closely um, on the ground with nearly 200 nonprofit organizations. I mean, if we didn't already know it before, and I'm sure a lot of folks on this call knew it, uh, we certainly know it now as a society that nonprofits do not get the credit on a regular basis for the role that they play in connecting people in need on a regular basis with the resources 
um, that they need in order to thrive. And we saw, you know, organizations that, that traditionally were organized around a very specific focus pivot in so many different ways because they knew their people, they knew their communities, they knew their neighborhoods. Um, and, um, and that to me speaks to the critical importance of investing in the nonprofit infrastructure. And so in about a half, about a dozen communities, we worked on the ground um, to ensure that there, that we were identifying both uh, folks who needed support and um, folks who could help them. So as an example of that in Chelsea, um, where we're, uh, United Way is operating one of, or not one of the largest guaranteed basic income project uh, in the country. Um, that grew out of a series of conversations with local Chelsea community leaders who were identifying the need among you know, hundreds, if not thousands of local Chelsea residents and raising up concerns about their ability to navigate all kinds of issues relative to the pandemic, food insecurity, childcare, housing instability. Um, and we were able to uh, raise those concerns up and identify key leaders like the Shah Foundation and Mass General Hospital who, um, who believed deeply in the community of Chelsea and wanted to um, make their resources available to help, um, to help ensure that the residents of Chelsea could navigate through this. Um, um, you know, in uh, Haverhill, uh, up in the Merrimack Valley, uh, we've done quite a bit of work with a, a volunteer group of leaders from um, neighborhoods in, in Haverhill with nonprofit organizations, with uh, elected officials um, to, on a weekly basis throughout the pandemic, come together, identify what critical needs individual families in Haverhill had um, uh, and be able to address and triage those needs um, as they were being raised. Um, just incredible close connectedness between local infrastructure and people who were in need and people who had resources. And, uh, and I think that those are the kinds of great examples that emerged during this period. Um, that said, I think some of the challenges that, um, that emerged during this period are the ones that we've all, um, we've all uh, uh, been talking about for, for quite some time, which is um, what does it mean to, uh, to uh, be equitable in terms of our response? Um, how are we lifting up the voices um, and bringing them to the center of those uh, residents, of those neighbors, of those community members um, that are most immediately impacted from that work? And while I feel like we did a, a good enough job in the moment, um, there's a long way for us to go before truly um, the residents of East Boston, the neighborhood that I live in, um, um, and others are really uh, setting the agenda for their communities um, and for their, uh, for their uh, neighborhoods across uh, this region. Um, and, uh, and I hope that, uh, that that's something that we can uh, see more of coming out of the pandemic. So thank you so much, Bob. Um, I'm gonna ask you to do something that's gonna be hard, but it's only in the name of you guys being able to be in breakout sessions uh, with individuals after this so that they get an even smaller audience and they get to ask you the questions they wish I would have because uh, there's a lot more wisdom in this uh, virtual room that is in my head. Um, so I'm gonna ask you to lightning round it, one to two minutes. And it's gonna be a bigger question than is worthy of a lightning round, but. You know, people, everyone wants to be a prognosticator right now, right? The pandemic is a magnifying glass. The pandemic is a mirror. The pandemic is a portal to something better. You know, like you've heard all these, everybody's got an opinion. Um, when you think about the topic of this panel, right? How we get towards equitable recovery with our usage of social capital. And I think Bob just hit on one thing you all did a little bit, which is which voices are, how proximate are they? who's controlling the conversation, who's in, at the table, who's at the head of the table. But I wanna ask you all, for the folks listening, when you think about how social capital, because we, by the way, all know, social capital can perpetuate inequities too, right? But when you think about it as a force for good, as a force for equity, give us a piece of advice that we can take with us to get, you know, to use this as a portal to something better. 
Um, Robert, I'll just go around the horn in the same order. Robert, Counselor Bob, and then we'll get you all to the breakouts. You know, I think, Dave, a few things I think about is, so that's a great question. If, if we really want to talk about social capital and, and equitable recovery, you know, the pillars of our city, if Boston likes to say we're the best, we're the first, we're the leader, we're the innovator, we're the best of this, we need our business, our academic, you know, our healthcare, and we need all of our folks collectively to come together. You know, Boston is not going to be successful if we're relying on one sector. And if we are the best, the leader, the first, the innovator, then let's be the best, the leader, the first, the innovator around social capital. And I guess the last thing I would say is we're going to get there because the diverse sector is going to come together. And don't be afraid to get on the ground with the people. That's where the answers are on the ground. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert, for who you are, what you do, and how you show us the way. Counselor? Yes, so lightning round. So really quick, I, I would just, I always say that um, Boston is resource rich, but coordination poor. And we could do a lot better in how, um, to Robert's point in terms of how we're all collaborating and working with each other. So I think pushing more on this idea that everybody should not only just be at the table, but we should be informing what the menu looks like because we all got to eat, right? And making sure that everybody's willing to eat what they put in, in front of you, right? Um, so I think it's really important to, to think about that. And then the last piece that I'd like to offer is that whenever I walk into a room or into a Zoom, I always look to see who's not in there because now I recognize the privilege that I have in the spaces that I have been invited to, that I probably wouldn't have been in those spaces had I not been a city councilor, right? So I always call that out because it's my responsibility um, to making sure that we're being really intentional and thoughtful. And it's not just about diversity in terms of race. You know, for me, I always focus on social economic status and class. And I think that oftentimes we do, we do all of these check boxing, but then we leave out a lot of people who are dealing with these um, struggles because we're not thinking about economic status. And I think that we have to start being more intentional about making sure that diverse perspectives also include people who are struggling um, to make their ends meet. Thank you so much. I mean, this is like masterclass here. Recognize who's not there and recognize the diversity of economics as well as other lenses through which we look. Bob? Yeah, I think uh, I, I'll, I'll echo slightly something that uh, Councillor Mejia said, which is <clears throat> we actually have to invest in the connectedness of our, of our sector. Um, I think for years we've, we've talked a lot about how we need to collaborate more, how we need to come together to solve problems more. And we just sort of say that and hope that it happens and we don't spend the money, spend the time, uh, put the intention towards what it means for organizations and sectors to come together and to work together. And it takes time and it takes resources. It doesn't just happen overnight. Um, and I'm more and more sensitive to that now as the leader of a philanthropic organization um, that is all about connecting people that we, we have to give uh, communities and organizations the space and the resources to build those blueprints together um, in ways that we haven't done it before. Um, and I think that's a critically important piece. The other thing I'm gonna say is we have to take care of our people in, the non in our nonprofit organizations. Um, it's almost like, a, um, like a, you know, putting the mask on yourself before attending to your, your child on an airplane, right? Like the oxygen mask. Um, our staffs, our folks in our organizations have been on the front lines so much over the last 14 months. Um, we have to tend to them and their needs and make sure that, that they are well taken care of, that their mental and healthcare needs are, are being tended to um, because those are the folks um, that we're gonna continue to rely on. Um, I think about, are we paying our folks a, a, a real wage, you know, a living wage doesn't feel like enough to me, a thriving wage. We should be paying folks in nonprofit organizations. Um, you know, we need to be making sure that we're, we're giving them time and space to manage all the things that are happening in their families. And, and we saw some of that because we had to do it uh, during the pandemic. We should have always felt like it was something we had to do. And, and we need to continue to do it and to continue to double down on it. Thank you so much. I have not come up with a, 
sort of acronym or something like Councilor Mejia did with the three or four Ps for the, but I might call it the 10 commandments that you guys just created of social capital. Um, the idea of, of proximity, the idea of engagement, the idea of not just being at the table, but setting the, the menu, which I love because I'm a food guy. The idea of investing in coordination instead of just talking about it. Um, and the idea of taking care of our people. I think not just in the nonprofit sector, I think in general, <laughs> we should figure out how economic distress isn't a brain affecting experience due to the stress that is caused by thinking through the next hour. Um, and, and we often make judgments to Councilor Mejia's point about economic diversity. Um, we structure things so that people who don't have economic flexibility can't participate. Um, we silence voices that are trying to get through the next hour by the way we structure things. So we've got tons of opportunity, um, I think, to, to be better. Um, and so uh, I'm going to wrap this and send you to, I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Mo, who I think is going to explain how you're going to get to breakouts with our three panelists. I am going to stand on my sort of soapbox on one other thing or one specific thing. I know I'm just a facilitator here, but the one thing I would ask us to focus on um, as we move forward and the work we're doing nationally on relationships and mentoring and social capital is stop talking about learning loss and obsessing over tutoring and catching up. Our kids have been through enough. <laughs> Our kids have learned skills and resilience and gained things in the last year while they've also lost things. And we need to meet them with relationship with ability to make it through a better place. You are not talking to the people who work for you about all the productivity loss and trying to get them to catch up. You wouldn't do very well managing people in the workplace, doing things that way. Do not affect our kids that way. And the wide obsession from all corners, from media to, to school leaders, to talking about learning loss and high doses tutoring drives me crazy. <laughs> they will need academic support, certainly. All kids do, but we need to speak to the to the heart and the whole person about what they've been to, through and remove barriers to learning. So we will try to rally people to relationship and we hope you'll all be alongside us. And we're deeply devoted to SCI and their example of how you get intentional about social capital. And we're deeply indebted to these leaders that are on this panel for showing us the way as well. I'll send it over to Pastor Mo to bring us to the breakouts. And I'm just grateful for being in this space with all of you. Thanks so much. Well, thank you, uh, all the wonderful panelists. Wow, what a what a discussion! And uh, thank you, David, for guiding us through this uh, important important conversation. Listening to the panelists, uh, I'm reminded uh, of uh, something in my own uh, tradition from India, uh, where if you want to be a force multiplier for good, Mahatma Gandhi had a word for it. He called it satyagraha, which means truth in motion. And, uh, and I guess that's, the, that's what I, my takeaway is, that, that truth in motion to be the force multiplier for good. And so thank you, David, and the panelists once again for this. Uh, just a quick reminder, uh, you can help uh, SCI be that force multiplier by uh, making a donation today. Thank you. And uh, so uh, continue on that. And uh, we've already up to, oh, wow, almost uh, uh, 24 Hundred, almost two thousand three hundred ninety-nine dollars, and a goal of raising twelve thousand by. By the way, June tenth, you still have some time. Uh, now, if you have a choice, we ask you to join this breakout session with one of the panelists for, for some more in-depth conversation. Please note that the event will conclude uh, with breakout sessions. Uh, this event will continue, so you're not going to be back in the main room. On behalf of the SCI team and its leaders and the peace servant leaders in here. Let me thank you for joining us today.